Hi, everyone. Thank you for coming out today. My name is Dr. Brian Waite. I'm a professor in the School of Education, um, and I'm also the department chair of secondary and special education over there. Um, in my other life, I also am the director of the Global Intercultural Program on campus. So if any of y'all are interested in getting a credential when you graduate showing your global and intercultural competencies, come and see me. All right, that's my shameless plug, Brian. Um, uh, we'd like to welcome you to this session of Ethics Week. Appreciate the Center of um, Ethnic Studies for inviting the School of Education to be a part of this important um, uh, week. The topic today is ethics, democracy, and education. And I'll be introducing our panelists and, and their expertise and role in the field of education. And this session is entitled, The Role of Education in Building Democratic Systems. So we are joined today by Dr. Axel Ramirez. Um, Dr. Ramirez has been at UVU for 20 years this year. Um, and we are still lucky to have him. He has extensive experience teaching in the public secondary education schools. His expertise is in history and social uh, studies, um, teacher preparation. He teaches uh, intro to education courses with us, but he also teaches all of our history and social, sci uh, social studies methods courses for our teacher candidates. Um, and he's a valued member of the School of Education here at UVU. We also have Dr. Carrie Ashcraft celebrating her fifth year at uh, UVU. Um, she spent uh, many, many years in the public schools uh, teaching, and she, in, at, in the School of Education at UVU, she basically single-handedly has um, led our, our classroom management initiatives uh, for secondary education and our teacher performance assessment, which is something that the state requires all teacher candidates do. Um, Dr. Ashcraft uh, heads that up, and she also teaches content. She's our content literacy professor. And new to UVU, just uh, over a year, uh, we were lucky enough to get Dr. Sean Crossland from the U uh, to join us. And Dr. Crossland uh, was brought on to lead, well, kind of create and lead our um, a new master's de program, master's degree program in the School of Education in um, uh, higher education leadership. So basically what he does is works with individuals who have an interest in working in higher education or who already do work in higher education and want to further that trajectory and uh, helps them with the intricacies of, of working in, in an institution like that. Um, all three bring an amazing level of expertise into this particular topic. Um, what we will do is have each one of them kind of do a presentation of their particular topic, and then we will have a chance for you all to ask them questions. Um, and we will start with Dr. Ramirez. Okay, so thank you very much for having me today. Um, I had some surgery on my nose last week, so I'm a little bit breathy today, so I apologize for that. Um, we're all going to talk about education in different ways, but the one that I want to focus on, because I, I work most with teacher preparation, uh, is does democracy extend to teachers? Um, in, in so, so I'm so sorry. I'm so used to wandering around the room. <laughs> it's hard for me to stay at the podium. But um, well the, the way I want to address this is that in teaching, as teachers, I should say, and the students who prepare our future teachers, we have to look at education as something that is something that we receive in terms of mandates and what we teach, but we're also citizens in the communities, and so we should be active participants within those communities. So what I'm gonna do really quick is I'm gonna show you um, each step that um, public education is affected by laws and legislators and mandates, but I also wanna bring up those spots where teachers can actually be active citizens trying to change the dynamics of the very systems that we work in. So this might be review, Civics 101, but that's okay. Um, all laws, all curriculum, all mandates, all policy for, for public education begins in the state legislature. So they are the ones that decide which way we're going, and then those laws and policies are, excuse me, those laws then go through the State Board of Education. 
And uh, I have a picture of Sid Dixon there, who's the superintendent of public education for the state of Utah. The reason I start off with those is because the legislature went to create those laws. The state office of education, the state board of education, excuse me, then uh, looks at how that can be applied to the public schools. And that all sounds wonderful until you understand that our elected officials, including the State Board of Education, which is an elected position, they are not necessarily educators. And that's not a bad thing, but that's why the superintendent is there. The superintendent is chosen by the school board, and in this case, she is a, an educator. She's been an educator for over 40 years, and her job is to help inform the Board of Education how those laws that now become policies should play out in the public school system. So that's how, when you're a teacher, that's who tells you policy and the way we're going in education. Now, this is where we come in as citizens. Each of us as citizens or as teachers who are also parts of our communities, we're the ones that elect the legislature. We're the ones that elect our members of the Board of Education. And so as teachers, if we're always saying we're being acted upon by other people, we need to realize that in our system, in our democratic system, we have a role to play also. If we don't like the way education is going in terms of the trends that are going or the, or the laws that are being passed or the policy that's implemented, it's our job as citizens to elect the kind of people who would enact the kind of policies and laws that we would agree with as teachers. And same thing with the Board of Education. There are 15 um, members of the Board of Education. I believe four of them are ex-educators, but it's the same situation. The majority of the people on the State Board of Education are not educators, and that's great. We live in a democratic system, but what are we doing as teacher citizens to elect people on the boards of education, to call them up, to talk to them, to influence them, to lobby them, to make the kind of laws and policies that we would prefer for our students here in Utah. So as a teacher, we have these dual roles. We are government employees who do, uh, to follow the core curriculum, the core standards and the policies that are out there, but we ourselves can influence those very same policies and curriculum that's out there if we participate in the democratic process. What I just explained happens at the State Board of Education also happens in our local school boards. I put up the Alpine School District logo just because we're in Orem and we're part of Alpine School District, but Alpine School District also has a Board of Education who are not necessarily educators. They also who has a, have a superintendent who helps influence those policies so that they affect teachers and curriculum. But we in our communities, for each one of our districts, should be getting involved in the democratic process because then we can elect people who are, um, who connect with the kind of policy and curriculum that we might prefer as teachers. One of my concerns is that we're always, as teachers, a lot of times we um, hear what's coming from the top down, but we don't realize we're part of the process. And part of being in a democratic system means we must involve ourselves in the process. There are over 20,000 teachers in Utah, and uh, if all of them got um, involved in the democratic process, we'd probably see things looking a little bit differently than they do now. But a lot of times teachers are grading papers and doing other things rather than getting involved. So this is my call to action for everybody here. Whether you're an educator or not, get involved in that process. One way that teachers do get involved is through a local education association or a teacher's union. It's not the only way to get involved, and I'm not here to promote teacher unions, but that's a way to have a collective voice in, in, uh, with, our, with our policy makers. I believe 53% of all teachers are a part of the teacher's union, so just a little bit over half. But again, that's how you get a collective voice, but that's not the only way to affect change. There are many other ways. On the very far side of the slide, I have um, caucus night up there. And I bring that up, and it's one of the things I love talking about, and I'm gonna keep my presentation short, so I will keep it short. But in Utah, we have a very unique system for electing people um, to government positions. 
and that is through the neighborhood caucus system. And I hope when I talk about the caucus system, all of you are like, oh yeah, we've been there. I've actually been to one, they're wonderful. But that's usually not the case because when I go to my neighborhood caucus meetings every two years, I rarely see other teachers there. Now, the way a caucus works, I'll try and explain it, is um, if you're a Republican, you have a neighborhood caucus night, and if you're a Democrat, you have a different night. And what happens is your literal neighborhoods are broken up into sections. I'm gonna say eight blocks by eight blocks. It just depends on where you're at. And when you go to the either the de Democratic side or the Republican side, you meet there only with people from your neighborhood. And these are literally your neighbors. I mean, you see them when you're biking around, walking around, doing whatever. And as you meet there for those caucus nights, you elect a precinct chair, you, you, uh, you elect some delegates, and those people go to the county and state conventions. Now, we always talk about grassroots citizen participation. That's where that happens. And when you go there, I mean, there's about, depending on what side you're on, Democrat or Republican, there are usually between 10 to 50 people there of your neighbors. We wish there were a thousand, but there's not. There's about 10 to 50. And what happens when you go there is you say, well, you just sit around and talk, and then eventually they're gonna say, who wants to be a delegate for our neighborhood? And most of the time when that happens, very few people stand up. Most people are there at the meeting, but they don't wanna get involved. And so you can actually be, if you're 20 years old, you can go to one of these neighborhood caucus meetings two years from now, and you can say, hey, I'd like to be a, um, a delegate to our either county or state convention. And if enough people in that room agree with you, you're the delegate. And now when you go to that county convention or the state convention, you are literally lobbying those people that wanna run for office. You have a one-on-one -on -one meeting with them. You get to talk to them, you get to affect change because your vote matters at those little, at those county and state conventions because to be get on the general ballot, you have to get out of there with at least uh, between 40 to 60% of the vote depending on the position. If you don't get that threshold, you don't move on to the le general election with one big exception that I'll talk about. But if you really want to affect change in our democratic system, you have to go to those neighborhood caucus meetings because that's where the votes come from. Now about 12 years ago, I'm probably off on my years, SB 54 was passed, which means that now a candidate can get signatures so they can bypass the, the county and state conventions and go straight to the general election. And some candidates have chosen to do that, some don't, but our caucus system still exists. So every step of the way, you can lobby a member of um, your, your local member of the House of Representatives or your state senator as, as a citizen and say, this is what I think education policy should be like. You can elect and lobby members of the state uh, board of education to affect change. You can join a teacher's union to affect change, or you can also be part of one of those caucus neighborhood meetings to try and affect change that way. So teaching in a democratic system means that you are acted upon by the democratic system, but you are also an actor within the democratic system. I just wanna show you one quick video of teachers who are, it's called the Utah Teacher Fellows, and they are trying to enact change as teachers. Teaching is political. I would argue that teaching is the most political profession that there is. Everything about education is decided um, by legislation, by elected officials, by the people that are voted on to represent you at your uh, local school board, the state school board. Um, education is one of the one of the very, very few careers where your salary is decided on. Um, by policymakers, the amount of days that you go to school, um, how much funding you get, what curriculum you can teach. It is a very political profession and it's important 
for educators to understand that process so that you are informed and so that you can make a difference so that if there are things um, that you want changed in education that you know how to do that. If there are good things that you want highlighted and shared that you know who are the people to talk to about that. It is something that impacts me directly in my classroom. And it's like, I knew that, but I didn't know that. And so when I am looking at the bills that are being passed or um, the laws that are being written, that could impact my exact classroom with my students, how big my classroom is, what books I'm allowed to read in class, what, um, what the funding is for special education, like all of that is directly impacting me. So getting engaged. So there's a lot more in this video, but I hope the, the main message I'm trying to, to say is that whether you're interested in education or not, we are all impacted by education. But as citizens, we should be active in determining what the education system looks like. And we do that by being civically engaged. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Dr. Ramirez. Uh, next, we will invite Dr. Ashcraft up. I'm excited to be here today. I see a lot of my students, so that's that's a nice, um, comforting thing when you're giving a presentation to see familiar faces. So, thank you for coming. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about democratic methods of evaluation and accountability within education, and how we as teachers can get involved with that and think about this in terms of democratic systems of accountability and evaluation within education. Um, so this is my area of research, but prior to getting involved in this, um, I was always interested in it as a teacher, looking at how our advanced class classes, such as AP classes, concurrent enrollment, um, honors classes, how are those classes made up? What are the policies? Are there any policies or are there things and systems that just happen within schools? Um, are those areas where I can affect change as a teacher? Uh, what when I walk into my school, uh, what's on the walls? Does it reflect the students and the community? What messages are being sent through that symbolic decor? Those are areas that you, as new teachers, may consider right away. And then as you have spend a little bit more time in the profession, um, hopefully you'll become more interested in policy um, as I did. So something to consider with democratic um, education policy systems is that it is connected to this idea of democratic systems overall, which is what we're talking about today. So the concept of democratic education forwards the following. It forwards more, but these are three brief points. Public education as a means of forwarding democratic principles. Individual participation in societal affairs is a fundamental aspect of democratic society and something that should be taught and forwarded through public education and that it is the responsibility of community members to reject power relationships which threaten democratic approaches to education. So that would be the lens that I would take as I approach systems um, and policies within education. So one thing to consider from recent research is um, Marilyn Cochran Smith mentioned that individuals do not intuitively understand how to live and participate in strong democratic societies, which is why we have this notion of democratic education uh, that comes from John Dewey as well as many other educational theorists and theorists throughout the ages and then today as it's centered more, um, more centered on strong equity. Um, along with that, uh, we wanna consider why it's important to prioritize and forward principles of democratic education and accountability, what that looks like for you as teachers, as I mentioned in the programs that you'll be involved in, and then also the larger policy uh, in terms of accountability and evaluation within education systems at the, at the school level, the a giant leap away from democratic principles to some degree, there was a top-down evaluation method that was forwarded. Sometimes issues with the, as they relate to democratic accountability in evaluation 
Um, but it's still, we still see the echoes in lots of places and primarily within evaluation systems and processes. So that leads me to how do we think about democratic accountability and what does this look like on the policy level? So there's currently three evaluation methods and this is from a recent article um, just I believe here in September of 2022 that goes through evaluation systems and published articles and looks at the approach to evaluation and as you can see, most of those approaches, even in the last 10 years, are still um, primarily post-positive methods that are focused on objective stances, more, more removed as they were in the accountability era. Um, there is movement towards a more pragmatic youth-oriented approach to evaluation, um, but as you can see on this chart, that is, is relatively small as well. Um, having just attended a, a, a I guess a workshop over the weekend um, or last week, there is um, a lot of movement towards this idea that evaluation methods should also be youthful and um, connected to how we can actually improve programs. But fewer, uh, fewer, um, or excuse me, fewer um, evaluation reports are centered in transformative equity-centered approaches, and as you can see, just two. And of those two, um, there's even fewer theorists um, that are, are focused on that. So within that approach, um, there is an, a, a lens that looks at qualitative methods, especially those that are centered in cultural respect, human rights, um, and really considering different and new methods so what does democratic accountability look like on the, the teacher preparation program level? Um, it could contribute to finding blind spots within programs, um, focusing more on community considerations, and a stronger focus on factors related to strong equity, which means that we identify equity within programs and what it looks like. For instance, back to the beginning, if I were a teacher in a school looking at which they don't students know. were included, in AP, advanced classes, honors, IB, concurrent enrollment, there's a, whether it's stated or unstated, a way that students enter into those programs. And often we end up with schools within schools, and so those classes look different than other classes may in terms of the demographics. Uh, whether we recognize it or not, there's a process that's happening, and uncovering that process through democratic methods of evaluation can help us shift what's happening within schools. Um, this can also contribute to uh, an ongoing shift away from those accountability era methods that were so far removed. This is a very short presentation, but essentially I just want to make sure that we understand that democracy is more than a form of government. It's primarily a mode of associated living of of communicated experience, um, and it often looks like diverse members of groups working together. Uh, within education, it's often our experiences that become an expression of idealized democracy. Um, so what have I been working on? So as I mentioned, my um, area of research is in this area. So what I've done is looked at systems and processes that would forward democratic um, evaluation methods. And one of those is a system called integrated concept mapping that takes a wide view instead of a top-down approach to evaluation and looks for as many external and inter internal stakeholders who may contribute to understanding not just a process or what's happening, but what questions we should be asking, which contributes to things that we're not considering, blind spots, who's not included, and so forth. So um, in recent research that I'm working on now, one of the questions is how can integrated concept mapping shift the focus of teacher pr preparation program toward a more democratic approach to accountability? And what we found through the research is that many stakeholders have a desire to be heard, that they have a desire to take ownership, that they seek a deeper understanding of issues within schools and schools of education, that they have a desire for strong collaboration, and that they want to consider the impacts of what's happening within programs and schools of education. 
so what grew out of that research is a, a phenomenon that I've titled um, or stated here, stakeholder commitment to evaluation is strengthened through democratic accountability methods. And what we found through this research um, that was initiated uh, by the teachers or the uh, professors within the program is that there is a desire to participate and that that grows as we involve more democratic methods for evaluation and accountability. Um, there's a lot of recent research on this now, so if you're interested, there's a couple of articles that are included in the, the link for today's presentation. It's a new and emerging something that's um, being talked about. We need more research, we need more undergraduate research, more graduate research, ongoing research that connects democratic ideals to evaluation and accountability. Uh, not all of the methods have been created for evaluation, but there are tools that we have currently that we can shift, such as the integrated concept mapping method that can help us um, identify how we can be more equitable and how we can include democratic processes in evaluation and accountability. Thank you so much. Um, so uh, appreciate that, Dr. Ashcraft. As we switch gears to our final um, presenter into the world of higher education, please be thinking of questions that, that you might have. It could be for any of the panelists. We'll have time at the end. So try to come up with some really hard ones, okay, and challenge. Which one is yours? Uh, the this one, one. yeah. All right, Dr. Frosty. Awesome. Hi, all. Excited to be here today and get to chat with you. This is also my area of interest, so I put these slides together basically to keep myself on track and not just uh, try to explain my dissertation to you and uh, my 10-minute presentation. So it is going to go probably a little bit fast. Um, I would much prefer to get to answer questions from you all and have a conversation. Uh, more of what I have today is a series of questions than it is answers about higher education's role in democratic systems. Um, I, I wanted to start with kind of framing all of the problematics in higher education and where, um, you know, where, where higher education stems from comes very much from a place of elitism, um, from, from separation, right, from uh, a, a ruling class sort of mentality and coloniality. So um, that's something that I think anytime we're having a conversation about higher education, um, we need to at least acknowledge, at least figure out you know, what role that plays in our conversation. Um, higher education more recently has, there we go, has, uh, has kind of framed itself as a, as a gatekeeper of the middle class, right? How many of you heard a narrative when you were in high school that said, if you want a good job, you will go to college, right? A lot of you probably heard that, right? So that is also problematic to say that the pathway um, of social mobility is, is, is only through higher education. Obviously, I'm a fan of higher ed. I'm here, I've dedicated my career to higher ed. I study higher ed. Um, it, still, it still creates a challenge, right, when we think about conversations around higher ed. Uh, and part of that is the framing of individual benefit. Those of you that listened to the, to the keynote yesterday heard about uh, hyper-individualism and, and, and higher education is certainly playing a role in this concept of hyper-individualism and how we, how we view ourselves as part of or separate from uh, the communities in which we live. So the framing of you get a better job when you go to higher education feeds that narrative of hyper-individualism that says the point of this is about me, right? The point of this is for me to, to move forward. Uh, and several of these things I think have contributed to what we've seen, what we see today, which is a, uh, a decline in the public perception of higher education, right? So I heard this morning um, on Inside Higher Ed that, that just under half of, of people in the United States today polled um, viewed higher education as um, the best investment of their time um, for their future, right? There's, there's layers and layers and layers to that. You should absolutely listen to the, listen to the studies around it. Uh, but generally speaking, we're talking a lot about this decline in the public perception of higher education. There's also ideological components to that, right, in, in the ways in which higher ed is viewed and who, who it's for and those kinds of things. Um, I'm going to leave those on the side, but we can, we can get into those in the questions if folks want. So I'm going to try to talk about, I'm not going to try, I'm going to talk about, I'm going to try to keep it in these two buckets of things today. 
Um, on the one side is thinking about higher education as, as part of these building blocks for democracy, right? So if we think about democracy as an institution, institutions have to be built. And so the, the big question there is like, how does higher education fit as a building block? Or is it a building block? Um, and if it's not, how do we make it a building block? Um, and what that looks like in terms of an outcome, uh, building democracy as, a, as an outcome for higher education. And then the other piece I'm gonna talk about is this idea of, of democracy as part of the hidden curriculum. So hidden curriculum, are there any education majors in here? There's gotta be a few if you're from Carey's class. So you've heard of Michael Apple, hopefully, maybe, right? This idea of hidden curriculum um, is about, basically we learn things even if they're not designed to be learning processes, right? So I took the train down today, like part of my experience of being on this campus starts when I get off the train, when I walk across that bridge, I see advertisements, I see other people, right? How the, how the bridge is or isn't working, if the elevator is working, right? If I have mobility issues and the elevator isn't working, that's part of the hidden curriculum, that's part of how I'm learning when I show up, right? All these things. Um, so those are my two buckets. Like I said, I'm gonna try to, try to keep it relatively um, in a, in a I, within boundaries to, to hopefully have a conversation. So from the building block perspective, um, one, of the ways that we can, uh, one of the ways that we can think about democracy uh, as a building block is through disciplinary approaches, right? So, so rather than when you, get to, when you get here and you sit down with an advisor, hopefully, or you're going through your, your orientation and your first year experience stuff, um, and they say, what do you want to be when you grow up? Or, or how much money do you want to make when you grow up? Or what's your, what's your major going to be, right? That's the question. We gotta, you have to answer this question. What's your major going to be? What do you want to study? And it's like, I don't know, right? Like, maybe you know, and that's awesome. I know I didn't know when I, when I started that journey of higher ed. I knew the things that I was interested in, but I didn't know how they fit into a specific discipline, right? It didn't make sense to me to say, why do I have to pick between psychology and biology? Or education and sociology, like those two things are the same, right? Like, um, so we asked that question of like, what does democracy look like within, within each of the disciplines? And then the, the flip side of that question is, what do those disciplines have to offer democracy? So not saying, okay, I'm an education major, the only things I think about are education, or I'm an I'm a, a engineer, and so my, my focus is on how things are made, right? Every one, of those, every one of these disciplines can turn around and say like, what is our role in democracy? What is our role in participatory decision-making processes? Um, another, another piece of this building block is, is student voice, and, and student voice throughout. Um, I spent a fair amount of time at a community college, and so we would often, I think, use the kind of, well, we know, you know community college students are not typically our traditional university students, they're not going full time, you know, they're less likely to be full time students and engaged in these different things. And so it's not realistic for us to get, um, to get student voice to, to, to contribute to all of these big complex decisions that we have to make across the institution because they're here for maybe a year or two or even at a university, they may be here for four years and sometimes that's longer than any one decision takes at a university to make. Um, but, the, but the point is if we're thinking about higher education as a building block of democracy, it turns out that students as the primary constituents should actually be the primary drivers, right? And we know, we know that's not the case because institutions are these, these big, big, massive, complex that, that require all of different decisions and we've got grounds crew, we've got sports, we've got all these things, right, that it's really difficult to think about what it would look like for students to be involved in every single one of those decision-making processes, but if our commitment is around democracy, then that's that's something that we you know we need to we need to reprioritize what that looks like across higher ed. This isn't I'm not not speaking to this you know specifically to UVU. This is intended to be like big picture higher ed. And then on the outcome side, um, one of the things that most institutions of higher education have some kind of of civic learning outcome to some extent, right? They they say we're going to make you know, more engaged citizens, or we're gonna make lifelong learners, we're gonna make people, we're gonna, we're gonna have, um, you know, we're gonna, we're gonna have an impact on student civic identity. Um, there's a big study that just came out from the American Association of College and Universities Tuesday, um, that uh, basically a meta-analysis that looked at almost all of the research that we have around civic engagement in higher education. And one of the biggest things that they said from that is, well, we need to do a lot more around this because we're still not, we're not able to, to, to empirically or, or quantifiably say, these are the kinds of impacts that we're having on student civic identity. Um, so that's a big, right, that's a big to-do list in the, in the higher ed world. 
Um, and then the, the other piece on the, on the outcome side relates to the idea of the disciplinary approaches, but it's, it's more about the where are you going with your educational experience in higher ed, right? What is the point of this? And hopefully, yes, it results in you improving your quality of life and, and having a job that, that is both meaningful to you and pays the bills. Like, I'm not going to minimize the importance of being able to pay the bills. Um, but hopefully also it, 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 it situates your, your visioning of what that future looks like in a way that also has some societal benefit, right? That it's not just, it's about you. Once you make that magic number that you have in your mind, that once you make that magic number, that doesn't mean everything is better and everything's happy, right? It's more about how are you, how are you fulfilling your role in, in, in the person that you want to be um, as, a, as a democratic citizen, as an active participant in your communities. So those are the kind of building blocks and outcomes side. Um, on this hidden curriculum side, this is where we zoom out from the student experience. So, so hidden curriculum basically challenges us to think about every aspect of the institution and how it plays a role in the learning experience, right? So if, if I were, um, you know, my, my, uh, my sense of belonging, my sense of as a, you know, as a relative outsider still here, this is just my, my second year as Brian mentioned, right? If I showed up here and I felt like, whoa, this is a whole new place and I don't think anybody like, anybody thinks like me, anybody wants to like, you know, wants to have these conversations with me. I feel like an outsider because X, Y, or Z, right? Any, any reason that that might be, that's gonna show up in the classroom and how my students experience their learning, right? That's absolutely, even if I'm, I have the best, I can put on, my, put on my, my professor outfit and show up and be prepared and do all this stuff and never once say, gosh, I kind of feel, you know, that will show up in the classroom. Conversely, if I, if I, you know, from day one, I feel like my, you know, my dean and my chair are, are supportive of me and really believe in my contributions, that's also going to show up in the classroom, right? That's going to show up in a way that it's like, cool, I'm feeling empowered to, to do everything that I can in every individual situation, right? So that's, that's part of how the hidden curriculum plays out. And then you amplify that across every single person that works in, in the institution. The person that makes your lunch today if you didn't bring your lunch, right? The person that's going to clear the snow across that bridge, right? All of those people are, are part of this, of this democratic ecosystem in higher education. That one starts to get really overwhelming, right? Especially when we think of it from this notion of, of full participation, which is, which is we have an obligation as an institution to figure out not just that there are ways for people to participate, but there are ways for each of you to participate fully in the way that you want to participate, right? And, and that looks, then it just gets overwhelming to say, well, we can't possibly do that, right? Because it's always gonna change. The student body is always gonna change. That's part of the challenge of being a democratic institution, right, is, is being able to change. Um, okay, so on the, the last two for, for, the, for the hidden curriculum piece, um, one is around democratic leadership, and this is a, this is a theme that you, you can hopefully connect between all three of those, is that um, we have an opportunity with every decision that's made at this institution to role model what democratic leadership can look like. Conversely, we have an opportunity at, with every decision to, to, to demonstrate what, what authoritarian decision-making processes can look like or exclusionary decision-making processes can look like, right? So that comes from, from at every level, again, in every, in every decision that we make, we have an opportunity to say, okay, how, how does this process become more democratic? How can we do this in a way that is not just inviting people in, but being willing to shape that system based on the ways in which you want to participate? Um, okay, so the last one, I told you I was going to go fast. So the last one, I actually I threw on as an add-on this morning on my way down because I, I was listening to some stuff about the environment and not feeling super positive about it, right? And so um, I, I, I thought it was probably important to connect this idea of like, if we're talking about democratic, democratic systems, there's also, a, there's also a life support system that is required to, uh, to keep our democratic processes. And um, as I was thinking about it, I was like, I'm not actually sure which one of those gives me more anxiety, right? Like, I'm not sure if the decline of democracy or the decline of our, like, planetary health, like, on any given day, I'm not sure which one, so I felt, I felt an obligation to just kinda, this one probably warrants its own, you know, I its, its own kind of platform and time, but 
Um, but I just, yeah, I needed to say that. So cool. Thanks, everybody, for listening. This was fun. I'll do a quick shameless plug, too. If, if you're interested in working in higher ed or you're thinking about what that might look like, I would absolutely love to talk to you about the master's program. So. All right, we'd like to thank all three of our, our panelists. Um, at this time, we'd like to open it up uh, to you all for questions. Um, please don't be shy. If you have questions for a, a specific panelist, please direct it that way, but we welcome general questions as well. And because Dr. Ramirez is our, our veteran, he can decide if he wants to answer it or pass it to someone else. Um, but there'll, there'll be microphones going around, so just raise your hand and Hi, my name's Austin, um, secondary education for English. And I had a question about the relationship between state policies for education and private educational institutions and how the how democratic systems affect private schools. Private institutions. So private institutions, K-12 institutions, I'm assuming your question is, they can pretty much write their own rules. They can choose to follow the core curriculum that's, that's a policy in the state of Utah or choose not to. The idea with those private schools is that they have this free market system though. So if people aren't agreeing with what they're teaching, they're not gonna send their, their students to those schools. But uh, for example, they can hire teachers that are not certified. That's, that, that can be a choice within that private system. They will generally follow the K-12 standards that are put together in, ter ter uh, in terms of curriculum for the state, just so that if their students go in and out of it, but they don't have to. But usually they do that as a minimum, and then we'll augment that with additional curriculum. I hope that starts answering your question. This is a question for uh, Dr. Ramirez, but if anyone else wants to chime in, I welcome more input. Um, regarding uh, primary and secondary education uh, in K through 12, uh, you know, obviously most, the vast majority of students can't participate um, in democratic elections for school boards um, through voting um, and those other primary means. Um, so do you view that as a problem since they are the ones most affected by those or um, not? And if you do, uh, how do you think we can uh, encourage students to engage I can't answer that. Um, <laughs> last year in the legislature, there was a bill that came forth from within Salt Lake School District where they were trying to have 16 and 17 year olds participate in the school board elections for that very reason. Uh, first of all, they are impacted directly. The other reason is that uh, why not get them voting now so that when they turn 18, they've already had that experience of voting. It failed, it did not pass in, in uh, our legislature, so my, my, you know what I'm gonna say next, right, is if you believe in that, then you should need to be contacting your legislators, your representative and, and, and senator, because that bill will come up again, I, I know the people involved in that, and tell them to vote for it, because I think that student voice is so important, and uh, we're giving students, 16-year-olds, uh, the opportunity to drive and participate that way and wreak havoc. So they should probably be allowed to participate in that democratic process. So please, uh, if it comes up, it will come up next legislative session. Uh, make some phone calls, write some letters. question for you, anybody would like to answer it, um, regarding small districts and large districts, um, school districts specifically, um, and maybe your thoughts about whether, the, you know, a, in a large district, the uh, participation in the democratic process might be a little bit more limited uh, versus participating in a smaller district where you can be involved and engaged in uh, the, dem the, the policy making process. Um, what are your thoughts uh, to put us in context, uh, any models that you would suggest to put in context current issues? I don't 
know if I'm going to be able to answer this directly, um, small district versus large districts, but um, I think it doesn't doesn't really matter if you're in a small or large district. I think as educators, um, if you're working in a school district, we have a responsibility to identify systems that um, are not working for our students and then try to figure out how we can get involved as much as possible. One policy that I talk to my students a lot about is simply the attendance policies. Often attendance policies just are not equitable for students if you don't understand or know or um, have access to understanding how an attendance affects your ability to stay in a school or be exited from a school. And so that from a policy standpoint, um, you might have a, a strong effect in a small or large district because um, in a small district, you might be able to talk directly to the administrator if there's just one high school or if it's kind of a K-12 situation. I have a friend who works in a very, very small district in Colorado and in that case um, you you can influence a lot just as a teacher by saying this isn't working and we need to make a change how do we go about that and so in many instances small districts might have more opportunities to affect change within their schools um, but in terms of going back to the legislature that I don't know do you have an answer for that mm. I, I would just say from a from a equity perspective the you know, it, it depends a lot on location and funding structure. That would be my, my initial response to that is around, you know, it depends on it depends on where those districts are, right? If there's a if there's a major tax base major tax base and able to have a really well funded small school, that's gonna that's gonna be pretty inequitable too. So I would lean probably from from that perspective towards larger districts that, you know, that share the resources a little bit more. But that's just my, you know, my higher ed take on it. And real quick, I'm, I'm assuming Doug's uh, question has to do with a bill that is coming up on a very recent or an upcoming um, election, right? I, this gives us a really good opportunity to really study what's happening in Alpine. If you live in the Alpine School District, please be informed on that so that you know what you're voting for and why, because the funding and equity issue is huge on this, right? There is a lot of dollars that are related to how big your district is. And sometimes people in the voting world don't look at all of those pieces. So we really do need to get informed. Is that where you're yeah, going? That was going to be my follow up. <laughs> so I know that with the rise of the pandemic, a lot of families have chosen the homeschool route. And so my question just stems from what are the cert like I'm just am not aware what certain policies are in place with homeschool at the moment and then how is that related to the democratic system? Is there a way to involve homeschool in that? And <laughs> uh, from my understanding in Utah, you can home your homeschool your st your student for any reason. You can take them out of the public school system for any reason, regardless. Every district, however, does have a mandate to support homeschool families. And so a family that homeschools can go to their, their district resource center, pick up materials, curriculum, those kind of things. So they're not completely disengaged. A lot of homeschools um, groups also uh, uh, gather together to share resources that way. So. In some ways, they're they're not they're they're invoking the democratic system because they're choosing to participate in their own way. But they are still c they still can be and should be supported by our public education system. So they're they're still in that mix as well. And I'm going to answer a question with a question on the democratic system side because you know just thinking of the of the quote that Dr. Ashcroft shared of like democracy being in a, a a form of associated being and what that looks like for you know, for, for somebody who's choosing to, I mean, I went to a rural school, so, but I think that's, that's a bigger question. It's a good question. Let, because of time, let's go to one more question and then um, we'll wrap up for the day. So um, I, f I feel like there's a, a bit of a gap between the, the research that's being talked about in the classroom and the, the community education. So like the things that parents know about what goes into how students learn and things like that. So I'm just curious, if whoever wants to answer this, uh, would communicate the research that you've done to the community and what's being done on that front with community education. I 
can just address this from my my stance, which is um, probably not as much as should be, right? It's not as shared as much as it should be. So one way that I think you can reach families and the community is to make sure that we're including them as stakeholders and then providing the research back. Some, and this was mentioned in a conference I attended recently, as often we will gather information from families, community members, um, but then that research isn't provided back to them in a meaningful way. So making sure that we're, we're, there's a cycle there that's happening, I think that's one way that we can include um, and, and help our communities become more knowledgeable about all of the things we're talking about. Um, and just from, so I published my dissertation about three years ago, um, and one of the, we've got an article in press now with two of the people that were kind of, uh, you know, typical subjects. It was my dissertation, but they actually supported me with it. So, um, so now we're co-authoring this this chapter in a in a paper, which I hope I hope becomes more of the norm in terms of what research looks like. Um, and then I'm giving a, a free presentation on my dissertation in like a month or so, um, which isn't isn't much, but it's still trying to. I think to your point of like trying to make sure that those that research is is made available and actually benefiting the communities is, is is a great one. So. All right, well, thank you. Before we thank the, the panelists one last time, I wanna thank each of you for being here. I'm sure there's a lot of things that you could be doing at your 11 o'clock hour on a weekday, but being here with us and engaging in this conversation means a lot. Um, and uh, so thank you for being here. And if we could just thank our panelists one last time, appreciate them being with us. I would just also encourage you to look at the calendar of future events for the um, Center of, of Ethnic Studies uh, that are going on this week. And just remember, every year this takes place um, in the month of September. So thank you so much.